Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to another Sheffield Libraries event and a continuation of our Wild Summer programme of activity which includes author talks, poetry and story walks, reading challenges, family activities and an awful lot more. So keep your eyes peeled on our Eventbrite page, on social media, on our blog and perhaps sign up for our mailing list to hear more about what's going on over the next couple of months. My name is Dan Marshall, I'm a librarian with Sheffield Libraries and tonight I'm really pleased to be joined by Natalie Berry. Natalie is the editor-in-chief of UKClimbing.com, a climbing and mountaineering website that's well worth exploring. She's an outdoor and adventure writer and a translator and also an expert climber in her own right, a former Team GB member. Tonight, Natalie will be talking to you about the book To Live, published by Sheffield's own Vertebrate Publishing, a book translated by Natalie that tells the true story of Elizabeth Revel's extraordinary climb and rescue from Nanga Parbat. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and if you in the audience have any questions, please just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll do my best to put them to Natalie on your behalf at the end. Okay, so Natalie, it's great to have you here. I'll now pass over to you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, Dan gave me a good introduction there. I don't think you need to say much more, but yeah, I translated this book, To Live, by Elizabeth Rabal. Um, I hadn't translated a book before, so it was quite a daunting task to um, yeah take this on. I'd done translations at university, I'd done various mountaineering related tra translations, but taking on a book felt quite scary and <laughs> never done anything like it before. Um, and Elizabeth's story is very personal, it's a very traumatic story, so that added an extra layer of, oh gosh, can I do this? I, I wanted to tell her account, you know, give a good representation of what she was trying to say. I didn't want to put words in her mouth. I wanted to make it accurate and true to her words. So yeah, it was quite scary. Um, I'll just show my screen and I'll start a presentation. Um, bear with me and hopefully the technology does too. Um, yeah, here we go. So Elizabeth is a French mountaineer. I'm sure a lot of you probably know the story, may have heard of it at the time. Um, it tells the story of Elizabeth making the first female winter ascent of Nanga Parbat, which is 8,126 meters. It's in Pakistan. It's the ninth highest mountain in the world and the second highest in Pakistan. And in 2018, Elizabeth went to Nangapaba with her close friend from Poland, Tomasz Matskiewicz of Poland. Um, and they were trying to climb Nangapaba and winter in alpine style. It had already been climbed in winter, but in a more complex, a less difficult style where, you know, there was a, te a bigger team and it wasn't an alpine style ascent where there's um, you know, no oxygen, no fixed ropes, no Sherpas. They were trying to fend for themselves, essentially, in winter, in really harsh, harsh conditions at altitude. Um, and I'm sure if you've heard the story, you'll know that just as Tomek reaches the summit, he announces that he can't see. He's got high altitude pulmonary edema or high, high altitude cerebral edema. He's snow blind. Um, he's just really ill, basically, and can't get off the summit um, and he says to Ellie um, what's happening with my eyes I can't see your head torch anymore you're a blur so they're both on the summit he can't see Ellie is feeling these <laughs> elated emotions but she has to get him down because he's in a terrible condition and he's not self-sufficient enough to be able to descend on his own. Um, so she has to help him and the book essentially, it's kind of like a diary style retelling of this tragedy. It's very in the moment. It's very, it feels very spontaneous. It feels like she's writing it as it's happening. Um, so Elizabeth has to descend very quickly and help him down. And um, they spend, Elizabeth spends three nights on the mountain alone in freezing temperatures and she shelters in crevasses until eventually she's rescued by two climbers from Poland 
Adam Bielecki and Denis Arubko, Denis is Russian, Polish Russian. Um, they fly in from K2 base camp and guide Elizabeth to safety. And unfortunately they can't rescue Tomek. So to this day, he's still on the mountain. Um, and the repercussions of this, when Elizabeth returned back home, people were very critical. They said, oh, she, she left Tomek behind. She abandoned him or she could have done more to help him when, yeah, the reality was she, she, she was helpless. Um, she just had to leave him in order to survive. Um, and their ascent, they were successful because they summited. It was shortlisted for a PLA door, which is one of the biggest prize in mountaineering, essentially, um, as the first people in the world to climb an 8,000 meter peak in winter in Alpine style. So no, ox no supplementary oxygen, no fixed lines, no supporters. Um, yeah, and the, the book just covers the whole story and then Elizabeth's return and how she processes, you know, how she comes to, term with, to terms with losing Tomek and leaving him behind and the therapy that she goes through and also about her return to the mountains because she, the last thing she wants to do when, the first, when she first returns home is to go back climbing. Um, she's very anxious about what's happened. She doesn't feel like she can be responsible for another person. Um, so this is Nanga Parbat. It's got a very fierce reputation. It's a very storied mountain. Nanga Parbat means naked mountain because it doesn't, it's very steep sided. It doesn't hold much snow. Maybe it doesn't really get as much snow as, as some of the other Himalayan mountains. Um, it's also known as the killer mountain because lots of climbers have died on it. About 60 odd climbers out of only just under 300 ascents. Um, that's probably, I think it's considered as probably the third most dangerous mountain in the world. It was first climbed by an Austrian climber called Hermann Buhl in 1953 in summer. So very different conditions to what Elizabeth was climbing in um, via its East Ridge. Um, and that ascent was drama, has been dramatized in films and books. And then some of you might have heard about the Taliban attack at Nanga Parbat in 2013, which killed 10 climbers and a Pakistani guide at base camp. Um, so for quite a few years, between about 2013 and 2018, there, weren't, there wasn't much climbing action on Nanga Parbat because of the danger of being in that area. Um, but of all the 8,000 meter peaks, Nanga Parbat's had the most winter attempts, um, not a sense, but attempt so lots of people try and pit themselves against it in winter for whatever reason i don't know <laughs> they're crazy um the first winter ascent um was made by simone moro an italian alex tejicon a bass climber and Mohammed ali sarpara who sadly is currently still missing on k2 presumed dead um they made that first ascent in winter in 2016 um, there's been PLA door winning routes on that mountain, the Mizano Ridge, um, but the route that Elizabeth and Tomek were trying, um, they tried that three times together in winter. They'd reached about just under 8,000 meters in 2015. Um, that was their previous high point. Um, and it joins, if you look at this topo, the route that they were following, this is the original kind of normal route, very direct, but they were following this black dotted line, which kind of traverses between these two major routes. Um, yeah, it was repeated three times in a row by Elizabeth and Tomek. Um, as you can see, it crosses a lot of, kind of glaciated terrain. Um, and this section here, you'll see it a bit later when we talk about Elizabeth's re rescue, she, descends all the way down here and then gets picked up around here. She can't descend further than that because that's a big steep icy face. So remember she's on her own and she's trying to get down and yeah, it's a very dangerous terrain to be <laughs> alone on. Um, 
So this is just a quote that I quite liked from Herman Buhl um, in his book, which was published a year after his first ascent. He says it's a symbol to conjure with in the world of mountaineers and for millions of others too, that peak of many names. Um, we all knew its history and his first ascent was very dramatic. He made the first ascent alone that his teammates had to turn back. He stood on the summit solo and then on his descent, he had to spend hours overnight on a ledge, just freezing and shivering in a storm and eventually got down. But yeah, quite a, a mountain with a fearsome re reputation for sure. So this is Elizabeth Revol. Um, you can just see that dot behind her is Tomek. Um, she's always much faster than him, so he's always in the background. Um, this was Elizabeth's fourth attempt at Nanga Parbat in winter. Um, and while the first winter ascent had already been claimed by that team the previous year, Elizabeth could claim the first female winter ascent of Nanga Parbat. And together, as I said before, Tom Econelli could claim the first alpine first ascent in winter. Elizabeth, she grew up in the Drôme region of France. She had a very active youth, like childhood. She worked in the fields with her parents. They took her walking and climbing. She did gymnastics. She eventually trained as a PE teacher. So you can see how that very active lifestyle kind of led to her being a mountaineer and being so comfortable in these environments. She even had a post of Everest in her bedroom. Oh, so every time she went to sleep, she'd look at Everest each night and dream of climbing it. Um, she said, I often ask my parents how mountaineers climb to the heights of the eternal snow. They responded, you'll find out when you grow up. So that's just a nice kind of looking back at her childhood and how that influenced her climbing and her career. She got into adventure racing and joined a youth expedition team and did lots of first ascents in Bolivia and Nepal. She was the first woman to link three 8,000 meter peaks. So Broad Peak, she linked Broad Peak and Gasha Brums one and two in 2008 in just 16 days. And she did it solo as well. So on her own and without supplementary oxygen, which is really impressive. Uh, unfortunately, before losing Tomek, Elizabeth had already experienced loss in the mountains. She lost her partner, Martin Minarek, died on an ascent and she had to, in a similar situation, um, leave him behind. He died in, in a fall and she couldn't return to climb. She felt like she couldn't return to climbing straight away. Um, she wrote about this. Um, eventually she felt she had to go back to the mountains because it was like a form of therapy for her but a life without mountains without high altitude is as unimaginable for me as life without my husband um she says she finds it quite difficult to put into words why she likes climbing why she keeps why she wants to go back when you know her friend has died her partner's died um but yeah i think mountains for elizabeth are a kind of escape um she feels she says I, up there i feel at home um i feel i find it difficult to put into words this is oh i'll just yeah and eventually um elizabeth made some ascents in kyrgyzstan and tajikistan um lotse and she did that in 2000, 2017 solo and again without oxygen. She'd attempted Nanga Parba in winter to about 6,500 meters. Um, she's very, as a climber, she's very organized, very regimented. She trains hard, she eats properly. She's more like a finely tuned machine or an athlete. Um, she climbs at a very fast pace and yeah, she's less, she, she isn't a kind of slow, ploddy mountaineer. She goes very fast. This is Tomek. 
he was born in Poland, but he was living in Ireland at the time before he went on this expedition. He had three children. He was working as a car mechanic in Ireland. He'd done a lot of Polish winter fast ascents. And we know that Poland's got a very good history of winter mountaineering. Um, lots of very famous winter mountaineers. They're like Jerzy Kukuska. Um, Elizabeth describes Tomek as a bit of a free spirit. Um, he feels things very strongly. He's a bit of a sensation seeker. He had problems with drugs. Um, so he'd been in and out of rehab. Compared to Elizabeth, he had slightly less mountaineering experience. Like he'd done a few summits like Mount Logan, Kantengri, like 7,000 meter peaks. Um, but really, as Elizabeth said, he kind of learned mountaineering on Nanga Parbat. He was obsessed <laughs> with Nanga Parbat. He'd attempted this mountain seven times. He'd spent 21 nights on it alone above base camp at high altitude. He'd waited, I think it was about four nights alone in a storm. Um, he was just a bit of a force of nature um, and he was the opposite to Elizabeth in many ways. He didn't train, he just, yeah, he smoked and he drank and he didn't train properly. Um, he sort of liked being on the mountain rather than climbing it. It was quite a spiritual thing for him, I think. Um, very slow and steady is always behind Elizabeth as well. Um, but he became very obsessed with um, the story of fairy. It's a spiritual kind of entity that local people believe live lives on Nanga Parbat. Um, and Tomek thinks that like he, he talks to the fairy and he listens to what she says and he says that she guides him up the mountain and she keeps him safe. Like there was one time when an avalanche was coming and she warned him of it and he was he managed to hide and things like that. And Elizabeth isn't sure what to make of it, but yeah, he's just he feels this affinity with Nanga and he says, this mountain won't leave me alone. So together, I'd say, yeah, Elizabeth and Tomek worked really well. They complemented each other, the very different styles of climber, I think. Um, but they make a really good team. Now, although Tomek is very, he, he's a bit of a rebel and a misfit, and he seems like quite a tough character. Um, Elizabeth says that he always visited the local people. There's one story of him giving someone in the Diemir Valley um, a pair of shoes because he didn't have any anything on his feet. So Tomek just gave him a pair of shoes that he wasn't using and just little things like that that kind of brought out the, the softer side of his personality. Yeah, this is Fairy, um, the myth or legend of Fairy. Um, he totally believes that Fairy speaks to him in his dreams. She's a goddess who either welcomes or rejects you. You must see her face in a dream, otherwise, you must not see her face in a dream, otherwise you will die on the mountain. That's what the people living in the valleys around Nanga Parbat say. That's Tomek at altitude on Nanga Parbat. He's a bit of a, a workhorse, as I said, slow and steady, carrying the big loads, just plodding along, but very tough physically and mentally. I think also Tomek was very um, reluctant to follow weather reports. He didn't really believe in preparing and keeping safe. He also doesn't, doesn't like keeping in touch with people at home. He prefers to just keep his head in the game and not kind of listen to any outside influences or check social media. Whereas Elizabeth laughs and she says, you know, I, I need to contact my husband, otherwise I would subject him to the anguish of being the one who waits knowing nothing while being able to imagine everything. So she keeps in touch with her husband, whereas Tomek doesn't keep in touch with his wife and family. So in 2016, when they returned to Nanga Parbat, Tomek was in a bit of a, a strange place really because yeah, sorry, it went, when they returned in 2018, because of the controversy in 2016, when 
the other team made the first winter ascent there was some a bit of sour grapes and there, there was there were comments passed from the team who made the first winter ascent to Tomek and Tomek got upset and it's hard to know what to make of that exactly in the book because Elizabeth doesn't go into too much detail but essentially Tomek is kind of seeking revenge he's very bitter that the very first winter ascent was taken away from him by this team she says he wanted revenge on the failure of 2016 a balm for the wound of his stolen summit for the humiliating and hurtful criticism he'd been subjected to that's Tomek at one of the higher camps um we're, so for Ellie um she it's slightly different for her because she still has the first female ascent to gun for. Um, she's less goal orientated anyway. She's not as fixated on that first and she's not that fixated on Nanga Parbat itself, but Tomek's just in a very almost resentful mood um, on this trip. So that doesn't bode well really for the, for the expedition. And then they reach the summer Ellie, what's happening with my eyes? Ellie, I can't see you anymore. You're a blur. The second lasts an eternity. She says that basically he looks terrible. His eye, eyebrows, his eyelashes are frosted. Um, he's bleeding. Um, she just doesn't know what to do. She's suddenly got this responsibility, not only for herself, but for, some, for someone else on the summit and she has to get him down. She says, today what hurts the most is that Tomek wasn't able to see this summit that he wanted so much. So she knows how much that mountain and standing on the top of it meant to Tomek, but you know, the, the sad irony is that he, he couldn't see it. He got on the top, he's so ill and snow blind that he, he literally couldn't see it. Um, he's blind, he's bleeding from the mouth and nose. He's got claw, like fists curled around in a claw. Um, he can barely move and speak. And as she tries to make him descend, she, she talks about doing this kind of rhythm of left, right, left, right. She's supporting him on a, her shoulder, um, but he's essentially a dead weight. Um, they get a few hundred meters down and he has to stop and rest. And yeah, suddenly she's got this guy who weighs a lot more than her. Elizabeth is tiny. She's a really small woman and this, big man that she's trying to get down is really difficult for her. She says his situation panics me. Um, she decides to trigger a rescue, which really goes against their approach on mountain. They want to be self-sufficient, but unfortunately in this situation, you know, it's a matter of life and death. She has to send a message on the in-reach um, communication device. She sends one to her husband and another one to her sort of expedition organizer. Tomek need rescue soon, Frostbite. You can't see anything. Please manage something with as soon as you can. So they're at 7,500 meters, of not that far below the summit at this point when she triggers the rescue. And this is just, a few of the messages kind of clumped together um, in the course of these three nights that she spends on the mountain. And these are, Elizabeth uses these throughout the book to great effect. They just kind of carry the narrative along. Um, just these kind of garbled Frongley messages. Um, she's just trying to speak to her husband, speak to her expedition organizer to try and get a helicopter to come as soon as possible. But the issue is that these helicopter rescues, they can't, they can't fly very far above 7,000 meters, even on a good day, like the atmosphere is so thin, they just can't fly, especially they can't carry multiple people. They can't be very laden. Um, so there's a lot of bureaucracy there's a lot of figuring out how best to do it and trying to figure out what Tomek is what condition he's in um there's a lot of talk about whether to collect 
Elizabeth first and then come back for Tomek or the other way around or do a foot rescue. And all of this takes a lot of time. Um, they spend a night in a crevasse and Elizabeth tries to find some supplies like food and medicine. So she tries to find camp four where she thinks there might be some, they've left some medical supplies. Um, she can't find it because she's on her own and it's dark. It's you know, probably gone past midnight or 1 a.m. by the time she's trying to look for these supplies. And eventually um, after spending the night in the crevasse with Tomek, he's just deteriorating. Um, she decides that she has to leave Tomek and descend. She can't wait much longer for, she just has to save her own life basically. Um, and she, she's really reluctant to do so, but um, she actually lies to Tomek to try and comfort him or keep, keep him away from the reality of what might happen. She says, I explained that I'm leaving to look for camp four again. She, she says, don't worry, the helicopter rescue is coming in a few hours. And then now I have to live with this last image of him, his hoarse voice and the parting hope that I gave him. She really doesn't want to leave. She doesn't want him to know that she might not come back. And at this stage, she doesn't really know. I think she still has some big sense of hope that she might, that he might be able to be rescued. But yeah, you can kind of read between the lines and realize that she doesn't think the outcome will be very good. But she has to keep a clear head and get herself down the mountain. And Tomek replies and says, Yes, Ellie, that's the solution. I'm cold, I want to rest. And those are the last words that he said. So at this point, if we go back to the map, they've come down here, camp four, that's where Elizabeth was trying to find the supplies. Um, she sheltered, she leaves Tomek here. And then between leaving him, she has to come down here. And then she spends a night alone in a crevasse here for 24 hours. I remember there's blistering cold winds, it's at altitude, she can barely breathe, every step she's taking is really fatiguing. Um, still nearly 7,000 meters where she's hiding. Um, in the meantime, she's still getting messages promising a rescue, but nothing's really happening. Um, She's still guilty, feels guilty about descending without Tomek. She keeps wondering whether to go back and find him. Um, I'm caught between reason, along with Ludo telling me to stay here, decided to climb back. Um, yeah, she just realizes that she has to keep descending and there's a lot of confusion as to what's really happening, whether the, there's a foot team being sent up, whether there's a helicopter. Um, she, she spent, this is a selfie that she took in the crevasse where she spent that night alone. Um, in this period, or certainly in, in the book, when she's describing this night, she talks a lot about wondering why she's there, basically. Why does she want to do this? Why has she put herself in this situation? There's a lot of soul searching. She's waiting for the helicopters. Um, she says, Tom and I were tired of coming back to this mountain. We examined the question from both sides. Was the summit important? Um, she, she said she just wanted to finish her project and climb the mountain, but it today it seems ridiculous. It seems, it didn't seem worth it. She's, she's really questioning her decision to come back to Nangaparba. In some ways it, it does feel like she maybe got a bit caught up in Tomek's obsession with the mountain and maybe she would have chosen to do something else, but instead she's here on a, in a crevasse on her own at 7,000 meters with a friend high above her, not really knowing what's going to happen. Um, she says, maybe I was my own worst danger, my own worst enemy, too locked into my projects. Um, She's trying to figure out what she's feeling at the moment. Um, yeah, I do get a sense of regret. Um, 
that she came back, but she says equally she would regret it if she didn't try and finish off her project and summit the mountain. Um, she says, I don't go up there to fight. I hate warrior analogies for mountaineering. I like the dramatic stories of mountaineers in distress. I go up there to live fully my life. She also talks a lot about, um, she doesn't like being called a, a heroine mountaineer. She really dislikes the labels that the media throw at people who climb mountains. Um, she's not in it for the limelight. She just wants to carry out her passion um, and climb for her own reasons, really. Um, and I think in this section, she's certainly wondering if she got a bit too caught up in her own ego and her own desire to tick something off. Um, and again, I do think there's an element of Tomek kind of influencing her decision to return there. And she says, I don't let this bother me, um, you know, thinking about what other people think of her. I quickly came to understand the discrepancy between what I am and what the media expect of a Himalayan mountaineer similarly. Yeah. She says, I don't belong in this show. I prefer reality, um, which is when you know what's to come when she returns back home after the after the tragedy and how much media attention she gets and how they misrepresent her in the media. Um, it's quite hard to read that, I think. She knows that she has to keep going. Um, she, again, she's in two minds, the plan's clear in my head. Um, I have to get off this mountain and organize a rescue down below for Tomek as quickly as possible. The wind's picking up, it's getting colder and colder. Um, she feels emboldened. She's getting really frustrated by the delays. Um, again, it's not like calling a taxi. There's a lot of obstacles and hurdles to overcome when you're organizing a rescue. Um, in the meantime, a uh, crowdfunding campaign has started. Lots of people from all around the world are chipping in to try and help fund the helicopter, um, which is was a really positive and quite yeah mind-blowing aspect of the rescue. I can't remember how much they raised, but um, yeah, really impressive that so many people chipped in to help. Um, so she's taking her own fate into taking her fate into her own hands. Um, she eventually she was very lucky actually because there were ropes that were left up by a Korean team, like fixed ropes, and normally they would have been covered in the snow in the winter, but there wasn't that much snow that season. So when she's descending in the dark, she's literally just got a head torch illuminating the way forward and she's managed to find these ropes to try and keep her on track and keep her safe um she's got frostbite she can barely grip the rope but it's just something to help guide her home guide her down and then suddenly a beam of light from the slope below pierces the darkness two beams and she's saying my god they, they climbed up they climbed up at this point she she wasn't sure she didn't know that there was a ground team climbing up to help her. She was still just obsessed waiting for this helicopter to arrive that never actually did. Um, a veil of comfort slides over me. I watch the ballet of light beams, the most fabulous spectacle of my life. I'm in petrified, perched on my rock, hundred meters above them, unable to move to comprehend what's happening. So she's in total, a sense of relief, but also shock that she's, you know, someone has climbed up to rescue her. She didn't expect that. That is Elizabeth in the orange jacket and either Adam or I think it's Adam um, on the Kinshofer wall, the, the steep um, section of the top of that I pointed out that was at the bottom, that wall that she couldn't have descended on her own. Um, that's her being lowered down there by the rescue team. And again, she's throughout this rescue, she feels really guilty that she's left Tomek, that she's getting down safely. But at this point, she also realizes that there's just absolutely nothing that they can do for him. Uh, this is from Adam Bielecki. He said, he's one of the rescuers. It was up to us to make a choice. We are not children, we are mountain professionals. 
we were very unlikely to find Tomek alive after all those hours spent up there. Um, you know, how, how could we have transported him down? Um, Tomek was a warrior. We should focus on saving Elizabeth alone. He made the choice to be a fighter. Um, they just, uh, apparently, Elizabeth explained Tomek's situation to a doctor and they think he probably passed away in a matter of hours after Elizabeth left him. So he really, there was no hope really for him to survive or be rescued. And then when Elizabeth returns, she has another mountain to climb because when she arrives in Islamabad, um, she connects to the internet. She realizes that people, there's all the newspapers have reported on this. They've been following her ascent. They realize that she's left Tomek behind um, and he's died on the mountain. She survived. You know, some of them were setting her up as a heroine. Others were saying we should burn in hell because she's guilty and it's her fault and whatever. Um, yeah, just lots of sensationalist headlines really. Um, and this really affects Elizabeth. In some ways, this affects her more than leaving Tomek behind in some ways, because she just wasn't prepared for it at all. Um, yeah, the crowdfunding campaign, though, that was kind of, it was a double-edged sword, all the publicity, because it did help to generate money for the crowdfunding campaign. Um, and they raised 157,000 euros um, to fund both the rescue and then it later went on to support Tomek's three children. Um, so that was something positive to come out of that. Um, after she deals with all the negative press, um, she has to go through therapy quite a lot of sessions of therapy because it's affected her so deeply. A therapist says to her, you saw your own death that, light, that night and you saw Tom's with your own eyes the day before. Don't apologize for being alive, Elizabeth. Don't apologize for having survived. Tom, it would never have wanted to, you to condemn yourself for him. So it's just trying to reinforce this idea that she, well, the truth that she just couldn't have done anything for him and it's not what he would have wanted for her to stay and die with him she's not it's not her fault she did the best she could she did the right thing um and sadly the year after the year after this happened elizabeth was in the other side of the story because she her friend daniele nardi who she'd actually attempted nanga Parbat with before and tom ballard they were climbing Nanga Parbat and they died in a suspected avalanche. The bodies are still on the mountain. Um, and Elizabeth was involved in the, the rescue operation for that. And she said it was the first time that she really realized or kind of understood or at least had some sort of grasp on why it was so gripping um, for people and why people might just you know, cast aspersions and put their own slant on the story without realizing it because she was in that same situation of desperately trying to organize things and having little information. Um, um, and it takes Elizabeth quite a while to get back into climbing um, in a similar situation to when she lost her other partner, um, Martin Minerick. She doesn't immediately feel ready to go back into the mountains. Um, she realizes that she can't, she doesn't want to take responsibility for another person on a mountain anymore. She doesn't want to climb with other people on 8,000 meter peaks. She just wants to climb them solo. So she climbs Everest on Lhotse, Manaslu, um, but this time she's not hung up on whether she uses oxygen or not. I think she uses a bit of oxygen on Everest um, and she's fine with that because her priorities have changed. She's not doing it for records. She's not trying to make a first or do anything special. She's just, she's climbing for herself truly. Now she's not trying to live up to anyone else's expectations of what she should do as a professional mountaineer. Um, it, and it's very much like a, spiritual and emotional rebirth for her 
going back up to altitude. Um, she calls it, she says it's closing the loop essentially being back in the place where she experienced that tragedy also helps her to work through it. Um, I actually, I asked Elizabeth um, whether her feelings had changed um, you know, three or four years on after the tragedy. And she said, talking about Nanga is still suffering. So she hasn't fully moved on. I don't think she'll ever fully you know, feel good about what happened. You know, she, she made the first female winter ascent of Nanga Parba in an alpine style, but, and she achieved her goal, but they, she lost her partner in the process. So it's not something she feels she can be happy about. Um, so yeah, I think she's still got a long road ahead. Um, I just wanted to share this. This is an answer that Elizabeth gave me in an interview. And I asked her, because I realized that the book, um, the title of the book has a, a lot of different meanings. You could interpret it in different ways, like to live as, to, as in to survive or to live as in to live life fully or to experience lots of things. Um, and she gave me um, some really nice answers, that I think, just show what her, um, thought her kind of approach to life and her philosophy to mountaineering you know she says it echoes the hope of life that always accompanied me during those three days of survival um if i thought about death i might not be here today some mountain stories of childhood seemed warlike to me so despite the tragedy the title would never have had words like conquerors combat death etc i think that's it makes her book very different from most mountaineering titles like she's correct there's a lot of books by men, <laughs> male mountaineers do kind of have those tropes of heroics and heroism and death and fighting. Um, and there's so few accounts of man, like significant mountaineering ascents, like Himalayan ascents, especially by women that I think Elizabeth's book really stands out for that. She said to live because after Nanga Parbat, life came back thanks to Everest. And today I'm no longer in survival, but living. Um, she feels like she can have some enjoyment in life um, through climbing for herself and doing different activities. She takes a lot of walks in the mountains. Um, she, I think she lives life at a slightly different pace now than she did before the tragedy. To live because I've always wanted to write something optimistic about mountains. Um, yeah, she says, that's why despite the drama, it begins with Everest and it talks about emotions. Again, not many mountaineering books cover that side of climbing, the emotional side, the whys and how you're feeling and you know, honest emotions. Um, to live because life is not a long, calm river except the various emotional stages that it's taken me through. In short, the whole range of human feelings of life. I say Elizabeth's book, Elizabeth's book is very raw and honest. As I said, it's quite diary style. Um, it's her feelings at every stage of that, those three nights and four days on the mountains are just laid clear. There's no sugarcoating it or trying to hide what she was really feeling. To live, because for me, the mountains have always been the most beautiful school of life. To live, because as Victor Hugo said, you are no longer where you were, but you are everywhere I am and Tom continues to live with me, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, That's just a very poignant um, conclusion to her answers that she gave me in an interview, but it says a lot about um, how she's processed everything and how she's continuing to live her own life, um, kind of in, you know, trying to honor Tomek as well. And it's really sad that his body still is, is still on the mountain. I don't think they'll ever be able to recover it. Um, yeah, I think as a book, it's a really, it's a, a really nice tribute to Tomek and to Elizabeth's own grit and determination to survive. Um, yeah, I think it's worth reading. <laughs>
it was it was certainly very gripping um I couldn't put it down so it made translating it a lot easier because I was just turning each page and translating each page I, I didn't stop <laughs> I translated it very quickly um yeah if anyone's got any questions about the book or translating it or Elizabeth um I'll try and answer any So, Natalie, do you want to end the yeah. Yeah. yeah bring some stuff up? Great, thank you. Wow, what, what a story. It's a great story, but it's a heartbreaking one as well, isn't it? It's hard to talk about for sure because yeah. it's very raw. <laughs> um, we have a question here from Stuart. When you translate a book, did you have to speak to Elizabeth and ask for her approval of the work that you'd done? And was there anything that she wanted you to change? Um, no, I didn't have much contact at all with Elizabeth, um, which is maybe a bit unusual. I don't know. Um, I, she, <laughs> I think because she, she's in the mountains a lot and she's traveling, she doesn't check email much. So she wasn't really in contact. So she just seemed to trust me to do do whatever I could with it and I don't think she read any proofs um I know it got translated into quite a lot of different languages and I guess if she couldn't read in particular languages it, I guess she can't really test it as such or figure out whether, whether it's to her liking but yeah I was uh -huh. grateful for that trust and quite a high level of trust how, how did you come to translate it I mean what's how does that work? Um, it was quite, um, yeah, just came out of the blue because I know the people at Vertebrate Publishing quite well. Um, and I think they knew that I did some industry related translation for catalogs or magazines and being a climber, not, not a Himalayan mountaineer by any stretch, but I think they just thought it might be something that I could connect with maybe also being a female climber because it is very different I think to other books you know historical accounts of climbs by male climbers um they thought it would help to have a climber translator um because there's definitely there's a lot of terminology that can be quite difficult to translate and for a mainstream audience as well you have to kind of put notes and footnotes um so yeah, I, di I didn't expect to ever translate the book and yeah, yeah. But I was good because I knew about the story beforehand. Um, I'd followed it in the news and reported on it a bit on UK climbing. Um, but it was really interesting to see Elizabeth's own personal account because you didn't really get to hear her side of the story when all the newspapers were accusing her of negligence and leaving a partner behind. And did you did you feel the pressure of that? You know, did you feel sort of duty bound or kind of yeah? Of yeah. I think I just wanted to. It, it's quite a close translation. You know, it's very true to her word because I didn't want to put a word wrong. You know, if you translated something wrong, um, you would just you could totally alter the facts of what she did or how she felt about something or you know the sequence of events you, you've got to be really careful because you're handling someone's story and people react to that in the way that they reacted to yeah news at the time so yeah. julie asks can you tell us more about um her career path elizabeth's career path um you know, she's a fascinating woman she's overcome all sorts of challenges mental states and so on is she yeah what yeah, so, did she begin what's she doing now yeah she qualified as a PE teacher um as I said she had a really physical outdoorsy upbringing um didn't she she wrote writes in the book that she didn't really get on with her colleague not get on but didn't feel that much of an affinity with the school environment like the, the teachers she wanted to be outdoors and adventuring and I think that led to her just wanting to full time, like follow a mountaineering professional career full time. Um, she got sponsorships and yeah, was able to kind of join some 
expeditions and there's, there's quite a lot of support in France for um, professional mountaineers and she did a lot of adventure racing as well so that was kind of a side parallel thing she was competing as an athlete and mountaineering and teaching and I think eventually it all became too much and she realized she preferred that kind of outdoor lifestyle. Yeah. And for anyone that's uh, kind of unfamiliar with, with this lifestyle, which is probably most of us, I mean, how, what sort of age range are these, are these guys? How old are people sort of still doing this sort of thing? I think for quite a, a long time, if you think of um, Mick Fowler <laughs> comes to mind. I'm not going to guess how old he is, but he's, he's like, like 60s, early 70s. You know, he's, um, you can pursue mountaineering to quite a high level um, until quite late in life, I think, depending on the kinds of mountain, the objectives that you go for. Um, you can just do a lot of slow plodding, basically, a bit like um, Tomek was quite fond of, you know, just um, maybe not carrying as heavy weights or, you know, maybe using oxygen. You can kind of, throughout your life, you can moderate what you do and change it based on the objective, really. Um, yeah. I don't think it's a young person's sport, you know. Well, they say um, if you live beyond a certain age in mountain, you've got lucky because, you know, a lot of people do die young in the mountains and don't get to live to a certain age, so... Yeah, if you can keep going, then I think you've you've done pretty well, no matter what you're climbing. Andy asks, um, because you, you're a skilled climber, you're a great climber yourself. Has yeah. Elizabeth inspired you to climb any 8,000 metre mountains? <laughs> no. Do you have a track? Well, it's funny because when I was translating this, I was in, I was living in Chamonix and I just like opened the balcony to get the washing in or something and it was free it was winter and it was really cold and it was late and I was like oh this is horrible and I was translating the book and I thought this is nothing compared to what Elizabeth had to go through you're on an 8,000 meter peak and probably minus 50 to 60 like wind chill and yeah <laughs> I don't know I, I can see the appeal I can see why they want to do it I'd love to spend more time in or any time because I've never been in Nepal and the Himalayas and Pakistan it just looks like amazing parts of the world but probably more for travel and <laughs> visiting base camp and villages rather than pushing myself on 8,000 meters. It's, uh, yeah it's a different thing to climbing Stanage Edge isn't it? Yeah. Um, Newton asks do you Hi. think this story will help other other women that uh, inspire the women? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, there's not many accounts at all of women in mountaineering. And a lot of the time when you hear of women in mountaineering, it's because of a scandal or a death, or like um, Alison Hargreaves, for example. Mm. There's just not many. I'm not saying this is a positive account as such because it's based on a tragedy, but I think she handles the questions of why she climbs and who she is as a climber very delicately and succinctly and I think she yeah I think a lot of women would read it and take some inspiration at the fact that she chose to pursue what she wanted to do rather than what she felt she maybe had to like a PE teacher career was more conventional she opted out of that and then yeah she has this drive to push herself, um, which is quite inspirational for yeah, men or women or anyone really, I guess. Um, and what was the second question? Um, do you think the media wouldn't have put the guilt? Um, yeah, still, I think if the media hadn't you know, piled in on her and called her, I don't think she would have enjoyed the success really I think she might have felt a bit better about it uh, like she was in hospital with um bandages there's a really vivid photo that I remember she was in hospital with bandages on her frostbite and there's cameras just in her face basically as she's trying to recover and I think the, the mental state that she was in you know after days of no food and she's just 
psychologically broken she's lost her friend um I think all of that was very traumatic for her um I think even if um they hadn't have criticized her I think that whole experience of everyone wanting to know what happened like either way it attracted attention I think that attention was very unnatural for her and in the state of mind she was in I think it was it was very damaging so do you think had she been a man had it been two men and one of them was left on the mountain and one had got down do you think she would have had the, the same attention criticism yeah it's tempting to say no she wouldn't <laughs> of course it I think again like the Alison Hargreaves situation the British mountaineer who died on K2 all the focus was on you know her children and she's left her children behind but you know loads of men die in the mountains every year and you don't really ask questions about their families or their wives um Elizabeth didn't have doesn't have children Tomek did um you know you maybe expect if it was a woman left behind she'd probably there'd probably be questions of like why was she doing it now her, her children don't have a mother and I didn't really see much of that for Tomek um yeah I think I think it would be different it's hard to say exactly what she would have received but um they're interesting questions I did try to think of what, what might have been said well it's a tragic story but it's it is an inspiring story as well so huge thank you for sharing um we are at half past so that seems like a, a good time to end it so Big thank you to, to Natalie. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's it a great story. And you've given us some insight into that translation process as well, which itself is, mm -hmm. is a real privilege. Um, so Liv is available to, yeah, available to buy now from all the usual places. You can direct to the publisher as well, Vertic Publishing, based here in Sheffield. Um, next week, I'll be joined by ultra runner Damien Hall, and he's going to be telling us his own story of discovering running in his mid 30s, only to go on to represent Great Britain, smash the record for running the Pennine Way, and then just a few weeks ago, breaking the decades old record for Wainwright's Coast to Coast Path. So, another very inspiring event, I hope. Thanks again, Natalie. Um, that was great. Goodbye, everyone, and I hope you'll join us again. Bye.